He used to be so, like, such a ball of energy and, you know, like, yeah, life, woohoo, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that and we're gonna have fun and we're gonna do this and it's gonna be awesome. It's Liam Mouse Vlog, Liam Mouse Vlog, it's Liam Mouse's Vlog. Hey guys, how you doing? And welcome to Vlogmas Day 8. Boy, I'm really sucking at this. <laughs> Man, I really thought I could keep up with Vlogmas, but I was wrong, clearly. Um, I've been doing my best, you know, I have been absolutely swamped. You know, okay, previous years at Christmas time, you know, when I've done Vlogmas and done the candles. Okay, the last couple of years or whenever the, you know, the biggest years, the biggest years for Christmas for me, I had 100 candles, if you recall in past vlogs and maybe you don't, that's fine. I think the top number I had was like 101 candles, okay. This year seemed exorbitantly way more intense than previous years, so I decided to count. Nearly 200 candles is what I had to make in that one week and no wonder it took almost a week because, you know, with working, also doing the vlogs, which didn't take up that much time. The candles took up so much freaking time though. And then of course working, living a normal life, trying not to have a nervous breakdown and sleeping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, I, I mm -hmm, nearly 200 candles this year. And with the orders that have just come in last minute, I think we've actually capped at 200 candles for the Christmas season. So that is an Underworld Connection record. And I want to thank you all for making that happen. That's crazy. No wonder I was this close to having nervous breakdown. <laughs> and I'm actually not kidding. I am not kidding. I actually had one night where I just kind of lost it and it just like the world just kind of fell apart. <laughs> and um, it wasn't a good night and it wasn't a good following day either. I um, had to take the day off work and JJ had to be superhero boyfriend and console me and be like by my side and be awesome. Cause like, yeah, I wasn't doing well. It was a bad, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't any of y'all's fault though, just because you ordered candles. That was me taking way too much on, even though I knew better. So that's that's my fault and lesson learned. That's not happening again. Mm -mm. But I'm super happy that we set a new Underworld Connection record for Christmas. That's pretty amazing. So brava to all you candle lovers out there. You are awesome. We did it together. E. So my hair is wet. Um, that's why it looks all scraggly and strange because I literally just got out of the shower. Well, I put clothes on first for your benefit. You're welcome. But yeah, I just got out of the shower, so it's still quite wet. So I'm sorry if I look a mess, but that is the essence of the pajama talks, you know. Oh God, I, I'm sh shedding everywhere. Ugh. So for today's pajamas, we have on our old Papa John's t-shirt. Keep calm and eat pizza. That's what I'm saying, which is exactly why I have this pimple right above my lip because I've been eating too much junk food, pizza included, and um, greasy got a pimple. That's how that works. Right by my eating hole. Don't appreciate it. And we've got on our hot pink Hello Kitty pajamas. Fuzzy, fuzzy, comfy, actually quite hot, and I don't like it because they overheat me quickly. So anyway, in today's Vlogmas, today's vlog, today's pajama talk, however you want to refer to it, I'm trying to sit so that the light isn't so splotchy and strange. I'm not as advanced as other YouTubers with like the ring light and everything. I've literally got a strand of colored lights around the window and that's what's illuminating my face. Hey, whatever works, right? This is the poor man's YouTube video or the poor woman's YouTube video. Anyway, sorry. In most recent vlogs, specifically the Vlogmas vlogs here, I've been bringing up my dad a lot just kind of randomly, it wasn't planned. It's just like things just reminded me of stuff and I talked about like his hot peppers thing, how he loved hot peppers, and, like the shirt that I was wearing, it was his. Just a couple other things that came up, you know, in the question and answer video about him and everything and my memories with him stuff. And I had a few people asking me, you know, like, you know, you never really talk about your dad. Like, you know, I don't want to intrude, but like, you know, I am curious about that. And you know, that's that's reasonable, you know, because I, I never have talked about my dad. As far as y'all knew, I didn't even have a dad. I don't think I ever even really mentioned him. Like, ever, <laughs> which is weird, I admit, and I don't really know why I didn't. I guess I was just sort of more focused on the topic at hand while making a video and like the subject of my dad specifically never really came up, I guess. So I figured I'd finally tell you guys about my dad. I don't mind talking about him. He's a nice person to think about and remember and 
I figure if some of y'all are curious, which is completely natural, it's, you know, human nature to wonder about these things, you know. So, okay, I will tell you about my dad. Here we go. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, this is to the best of my knowledge here. I think my dad's father came over from Germany with his family when he was a child. I want to say, you know what, I'm not even going to speculate on an age. I'm not really sure. But my dad's father had a lot of siblings and they came over with their parents from Germany, Bavaria specifically. My dad's father and his brothers settled in this one area of Ohio. You know, they were like super German. My dad's father married a lady, had three children with her, and then remarried my dad's mom and had three children with her. So my Aunt Kathy, which is the one that I showed you guys before, she plays the piano. She's the one that I have mentioned before. She's the pianist. She's actually the only one still living on my dad's side. The three other sisters from the from my dad's dad's first marriage have all passed because they were older. So from my dad's mom, the second marriage of my dad's dad. I'm, I'm sorry, this is getting very family tree-y, but you know, I just want you to know the, the background a little bit. So they had three kids as well. My Aunt Kathy was the firstborn, so she's the oldest. And then they had a second daughter, Joyce, and then my dad was the youngest and he was the only boy out of the six kids in that whole shebang and he was the youngest so he got spoiled rotten <laughs> not unlike someone else i know who was in fact an only child thank you very much <laughs> i don't know how i turned out how i turned out being a spoiled rotten little only child brat but here we are i don't know sadly my dad's other sister joyce passed away before i was even born so i never even met her and then of course my dad you know, he was the youngest. And apparently, now I've heard stories from when he was a child, okay? <laughs> and they're funny stories. Apparently my dad was quite ornery, but he was quite intelligent, okay? My dad was a real smart guy. Real smart guy. Genius level IQ, okay? He was actually accepted into Mensa, but he didn't want to be a part of it because he didn't want to have to pay the fees. And he just, I don't know, he was a really humble guy about his intelligence. He never really talked about it like everything I know about that stuff my mom told me and she said that she kind of had to like wrench it out of him because he just didn't you know he didn't bask in it you know but yeah he was a freaking genius so when he was little apparently he didn't speak like he didn't speak at all and everybody thought something was wrong with him <laughs> oh how little did they know <laughs> so whenever he wanted something I guess he would just point at things and somebody would go grab it because he was the youngest, he was the boy, the only boy in the family, you know, he had two older sisters and his parents, you know, they were all doting and they would just take care of him, he just point. So I guess there was this one instance at the dinner table when he was maybe four or five years old. He was that old and he'd gone this long without saying anything. And he wanted some water and he kept pointing and he kept pointing, but I guess the family was in conversation. And my Aunt Kathy actually is the one who told me this story because she was there and she remembered it and she told me this story. And everybody was talking and they weren't paying attention or didn't notice him pointing, you know, at the thing. And then finally, finally, he just up and said, could somebody please just get me a glass of water? <laughs> And everybody apparently was just like, he speaks. So my dad's first word was a full sentence. <laughs> and that sounds like him. <laughs> so my dad's dad and I think most of his family actually were all carpenters and they were really big into building things and including houses. There's this roll top desk that's at my mom's house that my grandpa built, my dad's dad. He built it, you know, by hand and it's still hanging in there. It's sturdy as heck and I'm gonna inherit this thing and boy is it heavy too. But anyway, so he built that and he also built uh, several houses around the town where they moved to and they grew up and everything. You know, I can literally drive people around town and go, my grandpa built that house, my grandpa built that house, my grandpa built that house. So my dad sort of followed in that footsteps and he became really skilled with his hands. He's a real good craftsman and he built things as well, but that's not all he did. And now you're gonna kind of see this start to take shape in things that I have inherited or learned or something from him because I'm kind of the same way as far as like I can, I can do this and 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 I can do this. My dad could build things and he also built houses. He built his own house. He built my mom's house. He built a couple of houses up in the woods area where we lived back there and probably several more that I don't even know about. But yeah, he built houses too. And he knew it all. I mean, you know, he knew how to do stuff. And the most impressive thing was that he could build a house without a blueprint. It was all in here. 
he didn't have blueprints. He just knew what he was doing and made it happen. Genius level. I'm talking genius. This guy was a genius, okay? And it was kind of annoying because when JJ built this bed frame that I'm sitting on right now, he built us this bed frame when we moved into this house. He basically did the same thing, and I was kind of just agog at the whole thing because he just like, he, he, I asked him to draw it because I couldn't visualize what he was telling me, so he just did like a little rough like this is what I'm talking about, this is kind of how it's going to fit together, but he didn't like have to like plan it out on paper or do the measurements, I mean he did the measurements in the end, obviously he measured twice, cut once, you know, obviously he had to do that, but he didn't like detail diagram it out, he just like went... Okay, this is what I'm doing. And he just like made it happen and then just like thought about how the math would work and like made sure his me measurements were right and just like did it. And I was like, that's uncanny because that's the same thing that my dad did. And I've never met anybody else who could just do stuff like that in their head and then just like make it happen. I don't get it. But anyway, I'm digressing. Maybe that's one of the things I love about JJ because he's really smart too. He's really smart. Just like my dad. And I admire really smart people. Anyway, so not only could my dad build things, okay, he also, by extension of that, I suppose, um, was an excavator. That was his main trade. He was into excavating. He had his own excavating company, which he did himself, okay. And I'm just gonna insert this in here. He didn't go to college. My dad did not go to college. In fact, I think he missed most of his senior year of high school because he went to Germany to be in, I believe it was some sort of like um, racing rally or something, like a, a motorcycle racing thing. I'm not quite sure. My mom told me, but I don't remember the details. But I just know that he left most of his senior year in high school to go to Germany to be in this racing thing, okay? He didn't go to college. He was just an entrepreneur and knew how to make things happen. So he made his own excavating company and he worked a lot on the bartering system. He was very popular in that town. Everybody knew my dad's name. Everybody, every time somebody met me, learned my last name, they would go, are you his daughter? Or do you know him? Are you related to him? And I'd be like, mm-hmm. In fact, we actually traveled out of the state a couple of times and my dad would run into people that he knew out of state. It was weird. <laughs> so not only could he build things, he was also a very skilled mechanic. He would buy these old cars, these old classic cars, one at a time, and he would restore them, work on them for months and months, restore them, and then I guess he resold them or something. I wasn't really a part of that. I mean, he let me, let me change a carburetor one time. That was pretty cool. I did learn how a carburetor worked that day, that's for sure. Taking that thing apart and putting it back together and him telling you what each chamber's for. Yeah, you don't forget something like that. So I learned how a carburetor works that day and I'll never forget it. <laughs> so he was always working on cars. He could do his own car mechanic repair stuff and restore vehicles and everything. Like, it was crazy. He was also really into motorcycles. He rode a motorcycle for as long as I knew, apparently. <laughs> apparently, my mom told me, um, they actually met on a blind date. <laughs> A guy that my mom worked with, who she'd previously dated, set her up with my dad. He's like, you know what, I think you would like this guy, I'm gonna set you guys up. So apparently he showed up, my dad showed up to my mom's house, where she was living with my grandparents at the time, on his motorcycle. <laughs> and apparently really freaked out my grandma. <laughs> but yeah, apparently my parents met on a blind date, which is kind of cool. So, that worked out well, didn't it? Yeah, I was super into motorcycles and I grew up riding motorcycles with him as a result. I've been riding a motorcycle ever since I was an infant, literally. He would put me in front of him on the motorcycle on the gas tank, like right there. And I remember how warm it was. It was so warm right there because it was the gas tank. It would be chilly, you know, it was chilly in Ohio. We went out to ride and stuff and like the wind and everything. But I just remember like snuggling on the gas tank and being like, oh my God, this is so warm. It's so comfortable right here. So I've been on a motorcycle ever since I was an infant. I can't drive one myself and I, I might be able to but I don't trust myself to do it. I'd rather be a passenger but boy do I love riding motorcycles. Love it! He was also really big into train collecting. He collected model trains and stuff and I still have some that I inherited you know after he passed. He was really big into model trains. Super into him. Like the really high quality stuff. I mean he liked real life trains too. He took me on a lot of train rides and he liked hanging around trains and knew a lot about them and stuff. Probably the biggest thing though was he was into guns. He had a lot of guns and he was a very, very good shot. And I know this is controversial for some people and I'm sorry, but we grew up in redneck country, okay? We were hicks in the woods. Everybody has guns. 
is just how it is. <laughs> so, but he had like a massive gun collection and he kept them obviously very safe. He stored them in safes. He even had a couple of secret rooms. He had a couple of secret rooms in his house that he built that you had to know were there to find. So that was kind of cool. But yeah, he was a really good shot. He was a hunter and he did hunt for practicality. He did not hunt for sport. I grew up eating a lot of venison, thank you very much. And that's deer meat for those of you who don't know. And it is delicious and I haven't had it in quite some time, but I do remember really, really enjoying venison. It's very good. And I think we probably had rabbit a few times and I know we had duck a lot. I actually remember going hunting with him when I was little and he took me duck hunting actually. I think I might have only been about five. I, I was quite young and I remember um, I didn't do any hunting. I've never hunted myself. I've never shot anything because I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But when he got the ducks, I remember him bringing them home and he had me pluck them and like clean them, you know. And I remember doing that and it didn't bother me. I, I, in fact, I actually remember it being quite um, cathartic. I was actually enjoying plucking this duck. Like it was just, there was something soothing about it and that's hard to explain, but you know, I was like five. I, I do remember it though. And I don't remember what duck tastes like and I don't remember what rabbit tastes like, um, but I know I ate them. And I think he did pheasants maybe too and stuff. Yeah, he was a really good shot. He would like practice too. He got into like, <laughs> he got into like cowboy action shooting. Like, I mean, he was good with a shotgun. He was good with a rifle. He was good with handguns. He mostly had revolvers, revolver pistols and he would do this thing where he would practice, you know, with empty guns, of course, and he would have like the two six shooters or whatever, and he would do the twirls and, you know, and like reholster them and stuff. Like he really got into that and he got pretty good at it actually. So of course, in essence, he taught me about guns when I was growing up. And I had my very own gun when I was two years old. It was a 22 rifle, bolt action. I still have it. My mom has it for me right now for safekeeping and I'm, a pretty good shot too because he taught me very well he told me all he taught me all about gun safety ever since I, I was this big you know never ever point a gun at anything that you don't intend to shoot that was the thing that he told me he said doesn't matter if it's loaded or empty nothing you never point a gun at anything unless you're intending to shoot it don't wave it around you either point it up or you point it down, or when you sit it down, you face it away from everybody. You know, he taught me how to clean the gun. He taught me how to take care of everything, the proper oils to use and the proper cloths and everything. And yeah, I mean, he definitely was very responsible when it came to teaching me about gun safety. And I was very responsible in learning it because I knew, I knew how important it was. In fact, he showed me once, he gave me an example. He's like, okay, so I'm gonna show you what a bullet can do, all right? So what we would do is we would target practice out the back of his house. He had like, I told you before, he had this massive property, just so many acres. So we had all these targets set up and like we had like the metal spinny ones with the like the bullseyes on them and stuff. But most of the time we would just set out like pop cans and stuff. So to illustrate the power of a bullet to me when I was very, very little, I remember this vividly too. He set out an empty pop can and he's like, okay, shoot the pop can. And I did. And then he went and he got it and he brought it back and he's like, okay, we still have a pop can. See that little, that little tiny hole? That was your 22 bullet that went right through it. You see that? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And he's like, well, you know, the can was empty. So it just made a hole in it. I'm like, okay, where's this going? And then he took an empty can. He filled it up with water, put it out there and he said, okay, now shoot that one. And I did. And it exploded. And he's like, why do you think that was? And I was like, well, the first one was empty. This one was full of liquid. It was full of water. And you know, I'm not sure of the science behind it, but obviously something about the water made it explode instead of just leaving a little harmless hole, right? And he said, yes, our bodies are full of liquid and blood and all these things, you know, our bodies aren't hollow. So if you shoot a person, it's going to cause something similar to that. It's not just going to leave a little nice clean hole and be harmless, you know? So, I mean, he really went to lengths to illustrate to me how important gun safety was. So I'm very grateful for that. And, you know, I'm grateful for him teaching me how to shoot because I do know how to shoot. 
I'm quite good at it. I know how to handle all types of guns. I, I know how to handle a shotgun. I don't prefer them because the kick hurts my shoulder. <laughs> I, I'm okay with revolver. I'm very good with a rifle though. Rifle is my choice of gun. I intend to get a big boy rifle one of these days, but um, I just have to wait a little bit longer for financial things to work themselves out and it's not like I can go shooting around here anyway, so. So on top of that, on top of his many talents and many hobbies, he was also a landlord. He owned many, many properties across the state and a few in other states. Like I said, that we went out of state and then we would see things because he took me to Tennessee because he had property out there and we ran into random people that he knew out there that weren't related to the landlord situation. But I remember that Tennessee trip and it was quite fun. He liked to play pool. He's the one who taught me how to play pool. Now, am I a match for JJ? I thought I was until I saw JJ shoot pool and then I went, oh God. <laughs> mm, I'm actually not good at pool like I thought I was. <laughs> But dad and I like to play pool. We went to this place called Charlie's. Every time we went to Tennessee, we went back a few times and I would always say, can we go to Charlie's? Because they had a pool table and they had like this really good food that I don't even remember what it was. I mean, I was like eight years old. But yeah, he <laughs> always make him take me to Charlie's so we could play pool. So yeah, he was a landlord, had a whole lot of property. And as such, I actually inherited a piece of property uh, when he passed and I became a landlord when I was 20 and had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I tried my best, you know, I did, but eventually I had to sell it because I didn't know what to do with it. I, I was inept, I'd never really learned that, which I thought was strange. Maybe if he would have been around a little bit longer, he would have ta taught me the ins and outs of things like that. I mean, I, I kind of was thrown into the deep end. I had to figure it out as I went. I mean, I did an okay job because I'm reasonably intelligent too, but huh, it just wasn't something I was prepared to deal with at that age, you know what I mean? So. That happened. He also owned a bunch of storage units, I remember too. Um, so I mean like the, the man had his finger in a lot of pies, okay? He was just, he was that guy, you know? And like I said, he never went to college. He was just self-made and he had, this is not something we ever talked about, but now looking back at it as an adult, it's pretty obvious. And I think my mom and I, my mom has confirmed this. Um, he was basically a millionaire. I mean, he, he was, yeah. <laughs> and the problem being is that he also, um, now I've, I feel a little bit strange talking about his personal life like this, but it is a part of his personality. The man loved to love. People also took advantage of him. It took advantage of his love to love and his money and his living situation and everything. So he actually married somebody before my mom. Um, apparently she turned out to be gay and he's the one who told me about that so apparently so obviously that didn't work out you know they had to separate and everything and then my mom happened which was awesome and he always spoke highly of my mom even after they divorced they were married for 20 years okay I was born in 1984 and I think they separated in 1989 so I was about four when they divorced and I remember, I still remember living in the house with both my parents. I do remember that. I remember living in my dad's house as a family with, with all three of us. I do have memories of that, which is nice. They're very small memories, very fleeting, but I, I can recall it. And then my mom and I moved out into another house that he built and we lived literally right next door, if you could call it next door. Cause it was in the woods and there was, you know, lots of woods and property in between us, but we were the next house up the country road <laughs> from my dad's. So I got to, wa I could walk down there and see him whenever I wanted. Then he could come up and see me whenever he wanted and everything too. So like we had, you know, a pretty good relationship as far as that goes. Cause you know, we live so close and it was an open custody thing. So like I could see him whenever I wanted to. And I used to go, it was like a ritual. We would go on Sundays, we would go to church together, which was nice. He was very religious, very religious man. Okay, super religious. Didn't always take kindly to choices that I made as far as like my appearance went once I got into high school. Like he didn't like the black hair. He didn't like the black clothes. He really would not have been crazy about the tattoos. I didn't get a tattoo until I was 25. And like I said, he passed when I was 20. So he would not have appreciated the tattoos. I'm sure I would have heard about that. <laughs> so we had our little rituals. We Every Sunday I would go uh, over there and we would go to church and then we would go usually to Sam's Club and get the free samples. That was like our thing. And then we would go to the mall. We'd get like a corn dog and a soft pretzel. And then we would go to Sears where I would wander around bored for about an hour while he looked at the craftsman section. <laughs> because he was all about the tools. He had his own shop, okay? So he built his own shop back up in his property. He had uh, two, two or three 
pits in there, like car pits, like you pull the car over it and there's a pit under it so you can work on it from underneath. And there was like a whole loft up top with like an apartment where mom said that, you know, the two of them used to live while they were waiting for the house to be built and everything. And the shop was huge. I mean, it was huge. You know, he had like woodworking stuff and like storage area stuff. And there was, you know, like I said, enough room for three cars in there at any given time at like different spots. It wasn't even right next to each other. And he had a bunch of four wheelers too. He would used to, ride around on his property on the four wheelers, just hours, endlessly, days. It was amazing. He liked to go mushroom hunting. He taught me how to go mushroom hunting. Um, the mushrooms that grow in Ohio, the wild mushrooms, are very hard to find. They're very rare because they never grow in the same place twice. And mushroom season is like, uh, you know, ambiguously like, a month of time and you just sort of have to know the conditions in which they'll grow where you can find them so there's no guarantee that you're gonna find them you just kind of have to go look and know what you're looking for and he taught me how to go mushroom hunting with him and I went a lot and we would always find pretty decent mushrooms my mom loves those things and I think I actually showed that in a vlog when we went back to Ohio and Holly knew somebody who had some gave them to us, JJ cooked them up and we ate them so those are the mushrooms I'm talking about <laughs> I know this is a lot of information but my dad was a guy. He was a guy. My mom used to say that he lived like five lifetimes in one lifetime, if that was even the number she used. I don't know, but he lived a lot of lifetimes in one lifetime. He did not let a single minute of his life go to waste. So there's a lot to say. And like I say, my mom agrees that the apple didn't fall far from the tree as far as that goes. Burning the candle at both ends is apparently a trait that I inherited <laughs> because, you know, I do all kinds of things and... That's just how it is, I guess. I don't know. I'm my dad's daughter, which I'm proud to say. And I was talking about his his freaking marriages. I'm so sorry, I got sidetracked. But anyway, so my parents were married for 20 years. That was his longest marriage. And then after that, there was another lady whom I did not like when I was a child. I, I think I was about six, six or seven when they got together, maybe. I didn't like her when I was a kid and I, I don't know, I didn't like her. You know, you just can't explain why you don't like somebody, but I didn't like her. And he kind of got upset by that, you know, but then she turned out to not be so great. So they divorced and I'm sure she took some of his money. And then he met another lady. I also didn't like her. She ended up being kind of a, a gold digging wench as well. She ended up probably taking a lot of his money too. And then he met another lady who was actually very nice. I liked her a lot and she was the only one who came to his funeral actually. I remember seeing her and I really liked her. I got along with her well. She had a ranch of her own and she had horses and we used to go riding horses all the time and I just loved it so much. And she was a nice lady. I don't know why they split up. I was a kid, you never know why these things happen, but they did. And then he met his last and final wife and married her and um, she they were still married when he passed away. And she and I have never really seen eye to eye. I'm not a huge fan of her. Um, which is fine. She probably doesn't like me very much either, but, and that's okay. But anyways, so what ended up happening was I was in high school and I did not know that he had developed prostate cancer. No one told me and that made me mad. Nobody told me for like two years because they didn't want it to worry me or something. I don't know what people's reasonings for things are, but nobody told me. They told me two years later when it got to, I'm assuming, stage four, they never really gave me too much information, to be honest. All I knew that at that point, there was no going back, okay? So he was in hospice care, and he, I don't know if he was going through treatments or not. See, this is the thing, I didn't really know too much about it, and that was very frustrating, but I'm pretty sure he didn't go through treatments, but he said that he felt awful. I remember him telling me that he just felt so awful. I was in college by this point, and then when they finally told me, and I just remember being so pissed that nobody told me before. So he was different. I mean, he was he was still the same person. He used to be so, like, such a ball of energy, and you know, like, yeah, life, woohoo, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do that, and we're gonna have fun, and we're gonna do this, and it's gonna be awesome, you know, and that was just kinda how he was. And then, like, seeing, the cancer take its toll on him was hard for me because like, you know, I knew my dad as like this headstrong, steadfast, fireball, invincible Superman, you know, and just seeing him sort of reduced to just, you know, his recliner. He was just in his recliner in his chair at that point and he would just watch a bunch of movies and he was never one to sit around and watch a bunch of movies. He did not do that. So that's like all he could do to just pass the time and he said that he was just so miserable and he was just so not himself, you know. 
it was hard. It was hard to see that. And it was also hard because he had to sell a lot of things to pay for the medical bills. So he had to sell his house and he had to sell his shop and he had to sell his property and all his land and all of his equipment and all of his machinery and stuff. And that was hard too. But uh, the one thing that he did say, he said, you know, before I die, the one thing I've always wanted was I want to own a Harley because he loved the motorcycles, but he'd never owned a Harley. He always drove like Yamahas and Hondas and whatever else, Suzuki's and stuff. And he never owned a Harley. So he ended up buying himself a Harley right at the very end. And um, he did get to ride it and he did get to own a Harley. I remember it was blue. It was like a light blue color. It's very pretty. He didn't get to have it for very long though because it also had to be sold. So just seeing him sort of wither away like that and watching all of his stuff that he worked so hard for that made up his livelihood and his life and everything, I it was a lot to process, you know, when I was 18, 19 years old. And one night I remember uh, I'm gonna try really hard not to cry, but no promises here. So I was at my mom's house, you know, which was still right next door there. And I was busy with something. I don't remember what. And um, I told, I, I called him. I called my dad because he really wanted to see me, I know. So I called him up and I promised him. I said, I will come see you tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> I said, first thing in the morning, I'm going to come see you. And he was so happy because he wanted to see me. So I promised him I'd come see him tomorrow. And then I did something that I'd never done before. And I told him that I loved him. I never said it first, ever, until that time. I said, I said, I love you, Dad. And he said, I love you too, sweeter. He always called me sweeter. And then that night, about three in the morning, my stepmom called the house. And she said, you need to come over here. Your, your dad has passed away. So, so I went over there. And the hospice nurse was there. And you know, everything, taking care of him. And I went in there to see him. And he's just... I couldn't, I couldn't accept that. He was just so still and quiet. And he was just gone. And I could have just, I, I kicked myself for so many years for not going over there right then instead of saying the next day because the next day didn't come. How could I have known that though, you know? But if I just would have gone right then. But at least the comforting factor is that I told him that I loved him, which I had never done before. So there's that, I guess. And um, yeah, I couldn't... I it, took me a really long time to deal with that and it was hard to deal with and I couldn't really very well. I remember I had to, the only way I could sleep was to take sleeping pills. I took sleeping pills every night for months because <laughs> I just couldn't, I was just, I couldn't deal with it and I remember one lady at our church probably gave me the best advice that I've ever gotten about my dad's passing, you know, people say the normal things, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss, you know, I'm here for you if you need anything, you know, stuff like that, you know. But this one lady said something that I'll never forget, and it was probably the best thing that anybody could have said. And she said, you know, I lost my dad 30 years ago, and I'm just going to tell you right now, it never gets any easier. And I know that seems like a strange thing to say and not the most uplifting thing, but it was definitely the most useful thing that anybody said to me that day because there's nothing worse than hanging on to the hope that, like, when is this pain going to stop? When am I going to stop missing him? When am I going to stop feeling the void that he left? 
and knowing that that day isn't going to happen just sort of removes that you know from your conscience and from your soul and just it I don't know it just let me breathe a little bit better I guess and and, and I will never forget that she said that I don't even remember who she was but I remember that she said that and it was quite helpful and I appreciated I appreciated her saying that to me yeah that was um how that went down and I don't have much of his left because like I said he all of it had to get sold um I have a couple of his train sets and I have his wallet my stepmom was kind enough to give me his wallet which still has his ID in it and there was actually three twenty dollar bills stashed in little spots in that wallet and I will never spend them I don't care if I'm living in a cardboard box in the street and I'm starving I will never spend those three twenty dollar bills his wallet is staying exactly how he left it and I'm gonna keep it forever and I have it in a very special place where nothing's ever gonna happen to it but the most important thing that I think that I could possibly have of his which I'm also grateful for my stepmom for giving to me, uh, is my dad's Bible. Um, like I said, he was a very religious person and he was also kind of a hick. <laughs> God bless his soul. So he has camo duct tape along the binding because it's so worn out and so used because he used it all the time and always read passages and he has tons and tons of little notes and like pieces of paper in here and bookmarks and just all over the place. I mean, he was, he wrote in the margins and he has little posters and everything. And it, I mean, he was just, this is like, this is him. This is him. And what I loved is because I actually uh, pulled this out to show JJ a couple of years ago. And weirdly, I'd never noticed this before, but I but I turned it open here, you know, to like the first page and it says presented to, you know, and then you're supposed to put your name or their name or whoever receives it by this person on this date. So I'd never looked at that before in all these years. And when I pulled it out to show JJ a couple of years ago, I looked at that and I was like, oh my God, I never noticed this before. Written right here, my dad wrote right here. When it says presented to and it has his name and his, his address. And um, underneath that, he wrote, It is the most important thing in life to be ready for the next life. I know now that no one can truly live life to the fullest without a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is my hope and prayer that my daughter, Leah, whom I love very much, and I'm very glad God created, does meet me in heaven. Leah, I love you. Dad. October 1991. And I, I just broke down into tears when I read that for the first time, strangely, two years ago when I pulled this out to show JJ. And, um, and then I looked at what the date was that I pulled this out to show him and read that for the first time. I, it didn't even occur to me that the day was November 4th when I did that, which is the day that my dad passed away in 2004. So I don't know how I missed that, how I missed that, that was his death day, that I just happened to pull this out to show JJ and then happened to see that written in there for the first time. I was just overwhelmed in the moment and thankfully I have the most wonderful man ever and he was very, very sweet and comforting in that moment I remember. and. Yeah, um, so this is a very important thing to me, and I love that my dad wrote that for me in there. He was a really powerful force. He was a whirlwind of a, of a human being. There is nobody that will ever be like him, I don't think, ever in this whole world. Try as we might. I'm really proud to say he was my dad. I mean, he had his faults, he had his flaws, he had his problems, but don't we all, you know? So, but he was, a, he was a good person, and he had a good heart, and he was incredibly... He took up so much space in the world. He, I mean, there were people that I was meeting even after he passed on. I remember this one guy that I dated <laughs> briefly. I went over to his house, like his parents' house, 
and um, his stepdad asked me what my name was and I told him and of course I said my last name and he goes did you know my dad and you know my dad's name and I was like yeah that was my dad he goes no way he goes I used to shoot pool with him all the time like I used to hang out with this guy and he would he would tell me he started telling me stories about my dad I'm like really this this guy that I just started dating brings me home his parents his stepdad was friends with my dad like this is how connected he was with everybody and just what an impression he made on everybody like nobody had anything bad to say about the guy he was just that guy you know Oh, and I also forgot to mention he was a very skilled musician. He played the guitar, he played the trombone. I actually do have his trombone, which is also at my mom's house for safekeeping. And he won a lot of medals and awards, <laughs> which are inside the trombone case. Maybe I'll show you guys sometime. He also built his own, uh, I don't know what you call them, boxcar derby racing cars when he was a kid. He used to enter those races all the time and he built his own, but he like, he won all these trophies and stuff, but mom said that he just got rid of them because he didn't care. Like I said, he was, he was humble. Like he did what he did for himself. He didn't do it for glory. He didn't do it for praise. He didn't do it for notoriety. He just did it for himself. And that was good enough for him. And he also, was the one who started to teach me how to speak German when I was little because he obviously his dad was German and he knew a lot of German and he had he made a he made several trips to Germany I recall so he taught me how to you know count in German and say basic words and everything and and I would like to go back to my my homeland one of these days uh, I would love to go to Germany and visit Bavaria because uh, apparently I mean I, I googled it my family tree if they're related there's a lot of people a lot of people with my family name up there in Bavaria, including a famous soccer player. Be cool if I was related to that guy. <laughs> so that is my dad. There was a lot to talk about there. There was a lot to cover and I couldn't possibly think of or remember or cover everything. But if you have any more questions and that you want to know, go ahead and ask. It's okay. Now you know. Now you know where I came from. Now you know the other half of my genetic material, you know Mama Mouse, now you know my dad. I do have a lot of VHS tapes that my mom sent me of when I was little that my dad recorded and he's in a lot of those videos as well and I just recently got a VCR so that I can actually like watch them and stuff so eventually I intend to somehow get all of those in you know some sort of semblance of order and make a, a video with clips from it because I think that would be cool it'd be nice for me to sit through them and relive them and go through them and maybe you guys would be interested in that too I was a pudgy little kid and then you could actually see what my dad looked like too in 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 action <laughs> so thank you guys for watching um today's video i appreciate you and i really appreciate you guys being there for me and being cool and being supportive it means the world to me so i'm gonna go ahead and end this now so don't forget to watch out for the sheep as always and vlog praise of the day is father knows best <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I was trying to think of something dad related and that's the only thing that popped into my head. So father knows best, I guess. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys next time. Hopefully tomorrow we'll see if I can keep up this vlogmas thing. I suck. <laughs> okay, bye.